We are continuing our study on the book of Romans. Uh, The book of Romans is a theological powerhouse. It is Paul's magnum opus. It is replete with all kinds of theology based upon the essentials of our salvation. Last week, if you remember, we came to the passage which formulated Paul's theme for this letter. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed or made manifest from faith for faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the overarching theme of the book of Romans is the gospel of Christ. And Paul will unpack over the chapters to come fundamental issues of our faith. He will talk about these foundations of our faith. And as he goes and builds on each one of these foundations, Paul is establishing good theology for what is essential to our salvation. Now, immediately after this thesis statement, some of us are going to be surprised on what Paul talks about next. He just said the gospel of Christ, and he was going to spend a lot of time talking about that, and he will. But immediately after that, from verse 17 to verse 18, he now begins to talk about the wrath of God. So the question Why would Paul go immediately from the gospel of Christ to the wrath of God? We'll talk about that in just a moment. But suffice it to say, today the message for you is about the wrath of God. Not a particularly popular subject. But here I'd like to hear from you. As we do with online church, I'd love for you to be able to give me some of your feedback some of your comments. So the first question that I have for you is, do we as a church talk too much about the wrath of God or too little about the wrath of God? And I'm not talking about Onancock Baptist Church. I'm just talking about the church universal. Do Christians talk too much about the wrath of God or too little about the wrath of God. I'd love to hear from you. And put why. Why you think that is. Now that being said, some would say, Pastor, the wrath of God is Old Testament. And that's true, it is. But it's also in the New Testament. Certainly goes without saying, Book of Romans is in the New Testament. Some people would say, well, You know, when Jesus came, he did not come teaching the wrath of God, but started teaching love. And I hate to have to correct you, but Jesus did talk about love, no doubt. But he also talked about God's wrath. He also demonstrated God's wrath. We could look at John 3 for one example. We know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We know that. But if you were to look down at John 3.36, what does Jesus say? He says, he who believes in the Son will have life. He who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus taught about the wrath of God. In fact, if we would just look at the eternal aspect of God's wrath, that is punishment for sin in a place called hell, Jesus talked more about hell than any other person in Scripture. Arguably, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. So we could not say that Jesus just focused on love and not wrath. Neither could we say that Jesus never demonstrated God's wrath. Most of you are already thinking about the time when Jesus cleansed the temples, throwing over the tables of the money changers, making a whip and driving them out of the house of God. Yes, he demonstrated 
the very righteous indignation of God. But yet, it's not a popular subject. And I understand that. But it is important nonetheless. One of the reasons why the wrath of God is not popular because our only point of perspective is the wrath or the anger of mankind. So we tend to look at God's wrath through the lens of our own wrath. Now when we talk about human anger or human wrath, it is oftentimes unprovoked, oftentimes unrighteous, oftentimes uncontrolled. Human wrath or human anger can be quick and explosive or in the form of resentment. It can burn low and slow and never stop. That is not like the wrath of God. The wrath of God is much different than human anger. It is always righteous. His indignation comes always from injustice. It's always pure. It's always for a purpose. The wrath of God is always controlled and always full of compassion. So as we understand the wrath of God, we've got to understand it different than we do human anger. But suffice it to say that the wrath of God is always warranted. That God has a right to his wrath. But I want to understand a little bit more about God's wrath. And that's what we're going to look at today. But as we will see in the book of Romans, Paul moves immediately from the topic of the gospel of Christ to the wrath of God. And we're going to talk about why. But first, let's take a look at this text. If you have a copy of God's Word, we are going to be in Romans chapter 1. And uh, this theological powerhouse of the letter to the Romans, we're going to spend some time in. And there's some great truths that I look forward to teaching with you about, talking with you about. But as we come to the truths in God's Word, one of the benefits of expository preaching that is, that we go verse by verse, is that it keeps us from ignoring or looking over problem passages or those things which are unpopular, as we see today, as we are uniquely acquainted with the topic of God's wrath. So let's take a look. Romans chapter 1, and we are going to begin reading verse 18. So as you are able, as you will, if you'd stand for God's reading of the holy, inerrant word. Verse 18, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring the bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, it is not an easy topic to discuss your righteous indignation. Lord, I confess at times it's hard for me to understand how your love and your wrath can coincide. But Father, I just pray that you'd help us to understand more about your wrath. As you led Paul to immediately talk about this wrath right after the importance of the gospel, I pray that you would give us great understanding according to the purpose that you have in your mind. Through this, Father, Father, 
I pray that we'd better understand the anger that you have so that it may motivate us towards the mission you've given us. This is my prayer, Father, in Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you. As I alluded to, the reason I believe that Paul has gone from the gospel of Christ to the wrath of God is because they are related. In fact, that's why he begins verse 18 with the word for. Now, I have to acknowledge the NIV does not include uh, that preposition, but I think it's important because it links the two. The gospel of Christ for or because of the wrath of God. The wrath of God, as is said in verse 18, has come because of the unrighteousness of man against all ungodliness. So God's wrath is directed specifically at sin. And because God is displeased with sin, because it angers him, that is the wrath. Now, I would never think a ruler, a president, a king, or even our God would be good if he just were to praise the positive things that people do and never punish the negative things that people do. I mean, would you be pleased with a ruler that only would praise the righteous actions but never punish the unrighteous actions? No, we would not. And so we should expect God to not only praise that which we do that is right, but also punish that which we do which is wrong. And that is motivated by his wrath. And it's important for us to understand that. How does that relate to the gospel? Wrath comes because of sin. Sin we are enslaved to. Sin that we cannot get out of our life except through the gospel of Christ. In other words, Paul talks about the greatness of the gospel, and he says, because of the wrath of God. You must remember, we have been told to take the gospel to the world. That is the mission. And our motivation for that mission, Paul is giving us in this passage, is because of the wrath of God. Whether we like the idea of God's wrath or not, it is there, and it is to anyone who has sin in their life. So I wrote it down this way, and this is your main idea I'd love for you to get. The lost are under wrath and need to hear the word. Those who do not know Christ are enslaved to sin, and the wrath of God is over them. The only way to get out of that is through the gospel of Christ, through the word of God. And we have it. We have the gospel. And we should be motivated to take it to people because we see the future. Because we see the wrath that is stored up. Now I asked you, do we hear too much or too little about the wrath of God? And I'm interested to see Stacy Johnson's, no, we hear too little of God's wrath. Lots of others agree. Amanda Elliott, far too little. It is understandably frightening thing, so we shy away from it. Angie Matthews, we need to know both sides. We don't need to only listen to the good that tickles our ears. Great point, Angie. Jenny, too little. We focus more on grace and forgiveness. Uh, Nelson and Mary, too little. Afraid of offending someone. That's a great point. Tony, too little because we do not understand that God's love and wrath go together with justice and holiness. That's great, Tony. Don Craig, too little because we want to make God more palatable for the unbeliever and the sinner. So all of us. We want to focus on his love and the grace so we don't have to face our sin. Great point. You guys have got some great input. So we understand that we oftentimes don't talk about God's wrath because it isn't popular. And I acknowledge that. It's not an easy text that we look at today, but it is important, especially to motivate us to the mission that God has given us. Because we understand that the lost are under God's wrath, they need to hear the word. 
And that's the main point I want you to get. That being said, there's an important thing I think is necessary to talk about in verse 18. In verse 18, it talks about the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Most of the time when we think about the wrath of God, we think of it as an eschatological idea. That is, end times. Uh, we're, we're thinking that the wrath of God is something that will be seen. And certainly that is true. That most of the time when we think of God's wrath, it is eschatology. We're thinking about what will come. We see in the book of Revelation talking about the seven bowls of God's wrath that he pours out on the earth. But notice that this passage doesn't translate for the wrath of God will be revealed, will be manifest. It said is revealed. That is a present tense verb. So we have to acknowledge that there is a present reality of God's wrath that is being manifested. We can see that noticeably in the great flood. God's wrath erupted on the world because of sin. We could also see that many times, like for instance on the nation of Egypt, because they had enslaved the Jews, a pestilence came about out of God's wrath. This brings me an important point, because the question is, is COVID-19 because of God's wrath? Now let me say this again. There are those people who would say that we are facing the coronavirus today because God is angry with the world. What do you think? Is COVID-19 because of God's wrath? I'll give you my answer. This is the best answer I have. I like this answer. Are you ready for it? I don't know. I have a tendency where I am cautious about speaking from God before I have heard from God. Certainly, we can see that there are times where God would bring a disease because of his wrath, because of sin. But we can also see in Scripture that there are many times when people thought there was something that was happening because of sin, and they were frankly wrong. Take Job's friends who came to Job and said, Surely your suffering is because of your own sin. So I, I, I really would encourage you to be cautious about just assuming because there is something negative on earth that is because it is a, a response, God's response to our sin. And we don't know that. But what we do know is God is angry over sin. That wrath will be seen most in the end times. In the eternal wrath that will be in a place called hell. But God's wrath is always warranted. It is always righteous. Then the question, why? Why is God's wrath warranted? Well, that's what this passage is all about. Paul gives us four reasons why God's wrath is righteous. Why he has a right to his rage. Why that his indignation over injustice is something that we should celebrate. And that's what we want to look at. The first we see in verse 19. First reason. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What is the first reason why God's wrath is warranted? I wrote it down this way in your notes. God has supplied us with fundamental revelation. The reason why God's Wrath is warranted because God has shown us who he is. That God has revealed himself fundamentally to everyone. And so, as it says, we are without excuse. What type of revelation is being discussed? I mean, we could talk about special revelation through Scripture, 
But that's not what Paul's talking about. He says that it's because of everything that's created. This we would refer to as general revelation. That people, when they look to the creation, they see that there is a creator. That's what he's saying, is that we are all without excuse because we can all see God's divine nature and his eternal power because of the created world around us. So here's my next question I'd like to hear from you about. How does creation help us know God? With, with respect of general revelation, how does creation and the fact and reality of creation Help us understand God. Because look what Paul says back in verse 19. He says that we have this understanding because of creation. For what has been known by God is clearly visible in verse 19. That means that creation helps us see the creator. then why are there so many people who look at the evidence and say there must not be any God? If we understand that creation always points to a creator, why is it then that many people would say there is no God? Why would someone look at something obvious and deny it? I say that shouldn't really surprise us. Men do that all the time. Probably daily, if not weekly. For instance, I am now in my 40s. One thing that should be obvious to me is that my body is not as young as it used to be. I am not as strong or agile as I used to be. This is obvious, especially to my children who remind me of that. Occasionally my wife will remind me, obvious to her. But yet, there comes an opportunity for me to demonstrate my strength and my agility. And overlooking the obvious, I try to demonstrate my strength as if I was still a young man. Why? In a word, pride. It is through the sin of pride that causes us to overlook some obvious things in this case, the evidence that is that, that God exists. Now, that being said, if we are proud, we will choose not to acknowledge God, but we will choose to rather pretend he's not there. Because if I am in my own pride, I do not want to acknowledge that there is a God that is over me. I want to acknowledge only myself. So it's much easier if I just choose to believe that there is no God. And so pride will cause people to look past the evidence that is obvious. We'll look at that more in just a second. But here's an important question. Is General revelation sufficient for someone to get saved. We see in this text that God's power, His divine nature are obvious because of creation. Is that enough for someone to get saved? No, it's not. The Bible tells us that's why we need to hear the gospel. The created world General revelation is sufficient for condemnation. We are without excuse. We should see that there is a God and that he is powerful. And we should live our life seeking him. But it is not sufficient to know that Jesus died for us. That if we receive him by faith, we will be forgiven our sin. And that's why we need to share the gospel. And I will say that I believe if a person responds to general revelation by faith, a sovereign God will make sure that person hears special revelation. In other words, someone over in some third world country, if they see that there is a powerful God because of creation and they reach out seeking God, whether it be through a publication, a missionary, 
or, or radio, internet, God will make sure sovereignly that person hears the special revelation that is the gospel, the word of God. But all the more reason why we need to be faithful in sharing God's word. Because it is true. God's wrath is warranted because he's already supplied us with fundamental revelation. But people look at that which is obvious, pointing to God, and what do they do? Take a look at the next verse in verse 20. Verse 21. For Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So we first have people looking past the fundamental revelation pointing to God. And instead of acknowledging God, honoring God, glorifying God, they did what? They became futile in their thinking, choosing to think around that which is obvious. As a, a man might think around the fact that he's not as old or, or he's not as strong and not as young as he used to be. So when people focused on pride do not like the reality that is in front of them, they will think around it. We call that rationalization. I wrote this down for point number two. God's wrath is warranted because he has been saddened by our foolish rationalization. That is, someone looking at the available revelation and saying, there is no God. This is most often typified in the theory of evolution. There are people that would say, well, if you look at the available evidence, it points to the fact that there is no God. Yet, I look at all the available evidence and I say it points to the fact that there is a God. Well, what's the difference? Well, someone who is focused on the theory of evolution, let's read that verse again in verse 21. They knew God. They did not honor Him or give thanks but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. It is foolish to me to look at the available evidence and take a leap of faith and believe that everything we see just came out of nothing. To put it another way, the example is often, say you were on a beach. You're not supposed to be on a beach right now unless you're exercising or fishing. So let's say you're exercising. And you see there in the sand a Rolex watch. Would you immediately assume that that watch has come to being by natural occurrence? That somehow that this design came about out of nothing? Or would you assume, as a rational human being, that because of the design, there must be a designer? Yes. Let's just say further that after you found this Rolex, that you decided to take it apart and look at how nice it was designed. Let's say that as you take this watch that probably cost $7,000 or more, you took it apart to its final pieces. I mean, you broke that down to where you could not take it to any smaller pieces. Then you said, I will take all the pieces of this watch, I will put it in my pocket, and then all I have to do is shake my pocket until I hear it ticking. It would be foolish to assume that out of all of that chaos, that there would become order. It'd be foolish to think that all the components would come together on their own without intelligent design. And that's what Paul is saying. It's it's foolishness to look at the facts and say there is no God because the, the, the facts point to the reality of God. Now I asked you, how does creation help us learn about God? And I want to give you some of the answers 
Dina, you said he is powerful because he made everything. Great. Gene Ames, because if we believe in God, we see him in every creation, every day. Russ Bailey, the heavens declare his glory. The skies declare the work of our, his hands. Our, our conscience tells us right from wrong. That's a great point. Teresa, I just see how everything seems to work in harmony. The moon, the seasons, the sun, and I cannot believe that all happened by chance. It's a great idea. It would be foolishness to assume that all this design did not have a designer. And, and that would be the same thing as assuming that a Rolex watch is going to come together on its own. If you just shake your pocket enough, soon you'll hear it tick. Don't do it. It would be foolishness to make that assumption. And I believe the, the theory of evolution has not been proven. The theory of evolution is just looking at the facts and thinking around them to say there is no God. And I believe in all honesty, loved ones, it takes a whole lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. And that's the second reason why we understand God's wrath is warranted because he's been saddened by our foolish rationalization. The text goes on and says it's not just the foolish rationalization, but there's another thing. Verse 23, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. What's he saying? Instead of honoring God and thanking God, they think around that and say there is no God. And that is not yet enough, but maybe out of a desire not to be left out with someone or something to worship, they decide to craft their own God. But they do not want the God that is true and living because they don't like what he says. So they'll just create their own God based after the image of man or bird or creepy thing. Point number three in your notes. God has been sickened by our false religions. God has been sickened by our false religions. The problem that makes God sick is the problem of idolatry. People fashioning gods other than the true God and worshiping them. Now, the question I have for you, and this third question I'd like to hear your response on, does America have a problem with idolatry? Why or why not? We see in this text the idea of people making gold images, bowing down and worshiping them. Now, we may not see that in America a lot, I've seen that overseas where people are bowing down and, and worshiping this statue. And, you know, in America that happens too, no doubt. And there's lots of false religions out there. But the question is about idolatry. Is America, does America have a problem with idolatry? And if so, who or what are we worshiping? That's the question. We can see the problem of idolatry throughout Scripture. We see very early on, God says, don't worship any idols. Don't worship any graven image. Don't bow down and worship anything other than me. But even the very nation of Israel struggled with idolatry. You can see in the book of Exodus, they have just been taken out of Egypt. They've seen all these miraculous things. And after seeing all these miracles, the very working of God to liberate them from their slavery... Moses goes up on the mountain. While he's up there, people begin to wonder when he's going to come down. They get impatient. So what do they do? How about we take all of our gold, we bring it together, and we'll make a calf out of it. That's a great idea. Then we can all worship this calf. You know, you look at it and you kind of say, well, 
How on earth did the people see the true and living God demonstrating all these miracles so quickly then turn to idolatry? Well, that's human nature. Again, with pride, we choose to try to make a God that fits what we think. Instead of looking to God and honoring Him and thanking Him, we do what? We make our own God. Now, this golden calf was made, and Aaron, the high priest, the first high priest, says, look, here is the God that delivered you out of Israel. Let's worship this big calf. Moses was still up on the mountain, and God looked to him and said, Moses, you better get down there. The people done corrupted themselves. They've created this idol, and they are worshiping it, claiming that it delivered them from Egypt. Moses obviously was quite upset and so was God for that matter because God is sickened by false religion. And there is a lot of false religion in our world today. I mean, there's lots of different religions, some of which are in America, but I would venture to say idolatry is a problem beyond just false religion. And that's a question I have for you, and I'd love to hear your answer on that. Does America have a problem with idolatry? And if so, who or what do we worship? Hearing from you, Jamie Morrison said, Americans have tons of idols. Peggy Rice, American idol is self. Many people make themselves God in their lives. It's a very great point. Amanda Elliott, yes, we idolize success productivity, and entertainment. That's a great point. Tony, uh, Nelson and Mary. Yes, prosperity, fame, possession, success, love of money. All things I was thinking of. Angie Matthews. Yes, I think we do it all the time. Unfortunately, we often put many things before God. Our jobs, spouses, television. Many things that we don't think of as idolatry. It's great insight. Stacey Johnson, sports, music, movies, and TV are idols in America around the world. I agree with you. We can choose to elevate a person out of fame and elevate them even ahead of God. We can choose to elevate our own popularity, power, or possessions ahead of God. Flora, Yes, our time we choose to do other things and do not take time for God. Tony, yes, we have many idols, anything that takes first place in our hearts. Patrick, the same type of crazy idolatry exists today. Look at the New Age stuff that pops up. Now society is trying to make our own planet and environment God. The point that we all agree upon, idolatry is still a problem. It may not be that we would take a golden calf and bow down and worship it. But how many things take first place in our life instead of God? How many things is a false religion? Well, that sickens God. And that's a reason why his wrath is warranted. Because he's made it plain to us. Fundamental revelation. But yet, out of our pride, we foolishly rationalize and say there is no God, and then we make gods after our own image with false religions. And then there's one final point that Paul tells us about, and this we're going to see in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. What's he talking about? At first glance, it seems like God is complicit towards sin. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts in impurity. We, we, we should obviously understand that that's not the case. Uh, the original language here, talking about giving someone up, is like leaving them alone to. It would be similar to say God abandoned them to their sin. It would be that there are people that are going to choose sin to follow the the desires of their flesh. And God says, look, if you go down that road, I can't go with you. 
I can't follow you. And so they choose. And God, in effect, is giving them up to that, surrendering himself from them. You know, as a pastor, I've had to break fellowship with people because of sin. You know, it may not surprise you, but there have been men that have come to me and say, hey, I'm abandoning my wife. They didn't say it that way. They say, you know what, I'm leaving my wife and I'm going to go marry somebody else. And I say, brother, if you do that, I can't follow you down that road. That is not good. You know, I have had women that would say that they are engaging in an extramarital affair, but they're not going to stop. They, they feel like, okay, it's probably all right as long as my husband doesn't find out, and even if he does. People that are so consumed by dishonesty that they can't just say, I was lying. All of these things happen, and I as a pastor have to say, look, I can't go with you down that road. The difference is, I couldn't stop them if I wanted to. I I do not have the power to force someone not to sin. But God does. So in effect, God is giving them over to this because he's choosing for them to have their own free will rather than restraining them against their will, making them do what is right. That's all the text is saying. And so I wrote it down this way for point number four. God has surrendered them to their fleshly rebellion. Why is God's wrath warranted? Because God has surrendered them to their fleshly rebellion. There will be two types of people at the end of time. There will be those people who look to God and say, your will be done. And then there will be another group of people to whom which God will look to them and say, your will be done. Because when people choose the desires of their own flesh, their own impurity, God will give you that choice. He will not force you to do what's right. But in fact, he will, in a sense, abandon you, give you up to that. And that's what this text is talking about. That God is, is, is really going to get to a point where he says, you know, I can't go down that road with you. Like the father of the prodigal son. But still, that's not where God leaves us. God doesn't stop there. We can see that sin keeps on going. If you were to look in verse 26, it says, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Uh, and it talks about the sin of homosexuality there. Then it talks about verse 28. God gave them up to a debased mind. That there is this progression of sin that, you know, if I get to this point, I'll, I'll want more. And, and, and God's going to say, you know what, I can't go down that road with you. But if that's what you choose, I'm not going to stop you. And it continues on. And so it seemed like there's no end in sight that we are all destined for the wrath of God because we all choose the wrong things. It's in our very nature. But praise God, that's not the end of the story. You see, when we look around all of this picture, that is our history, as we look to the very nature of God, it can be hard for us to say, how can God be a God of wrath, and be a God of love. How can wrath and love be together in God? But if we were to look close, that God's wrath and God's love intersect. And where they cross is a point in which Jesus died for us. Because as we look to the sacrifice of Christ, we see that God's love was demonstrated in that death for us. And God's wrath was taken away because sin was completely and totally punished. That is, God's justice was served. God's love was served simultaneously Through the act of Jesus dying on the cross, do we see love and wrath come together? 
Now, this is your first concluding point, and I want you to write this down. We're going to review in just a second, but I wrote this down. God's love and wrath intersect at the cross. God did not stop in his wrath and say, you all deserve to be punished, and that's it. But it was because of the love of God that we see that Jesus came to die for us. It's because of that great love that the wrath was no more. If you are a follower of Christ, you are not under wrath because Jesus paid the price for you. But if you are not a follower of Christ, if you've not received him as your Savior, you are under God's wrath. Now let's go back to the main idea, and I want to review. One point after, and then we'll be done. The lost are under wrath and need to hear the word. We understand that God's wrath is justified. We understand that the only way out of God's wrath is to be forgiven of our sin through what Jesus did for us. We give you four reasons in this text why God's wrath is warranted. Point number one, God has supplied us with fundamental revelation. Secondly, God has been saddened by our foolish rationalization. Thirdly, God has been sickened by our false religion. And God has surrendered them to their fleshly rebellion. If we continue down sin, God will abandon us on that end. And that road of sin ultimately to a point where God is not and will not be for eternity. That place called hell is a place where people will be forever separated from God. That is God's eternal wrath. Now I hate when people say, why would God send anyone to hell if he's loving? God never sends people to hell in the sense he doesn't want anyone to experience his wrath. The second Peter says that he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And not only that, but in 1 Timothy 2, it says that God desires for all people to be saved. God does not want wrath to be the end of the story, but because of his love, Jesus died to pay the price, appeasing God's anger. It then just becomes upon us to choose Christ. Loved one, if you've never made Christ your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Now, beyond that, as a follower of Christ, you now possess that gospel. And it is our responsibility, our mission, to take the gospel to the world. And that's really what this passage should do, is motivate us towards mission. And this is why, and I wrote this down as your last point, God wants to reach the world through the church. God wants to reach the world through the church. Why? At times, I'll be honest, I wonder why. But God's plan is for us, recipients of the kingdom of God, possessors of faith and salvation, to go and to share the word of God. Because the world, those who are in the world, those who are lost are under God's wrath. But he doesn't want them to stay there. And so we go and share the good news to them. Loved ones, we cannot make anyone choose it. But we can present it. I, this last passage I'll read you. And then we'll be done. The Bible tells us, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the great privilege that we have. As followers of Christ, we are now ambassadors for God, going out into a lost world and say, Please choose Jesus. Loved one, you have a great privilege and responsibility in the mission of Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that as we understand this mission and the motivation for this,
that we would be faithful in sharing Jesus to others. Last week, I challenged you to be praying for one person that you'd have the opportunity to share your faith with. Some of you may have already been able to share your faith, and I praise God for your faithfulness. If not, keep praying and keep looking for the opportunity to share. My challenge is still the same. Choose one person. Pray for them daily that they would come to know Jesus, that you would have the opportunity and the courage to share with them. That's my challenge to you. Let's pray. Father, you've given us a great privilege and a responsibility of being your ambassador to the world. Lord, we have to acknowledge that you are angry with sin, that you do not tolerate it and you will not last forever looking at it. But Father, although we may not like the topic of your wrath, it is all more real. And Lord, I just pray that it would motivate us to go out into the world and to share your love. That as we understand your wrath and your love intersecting at the cross of Jesus Christ, we can tell the world, we can plead with them to be reconciled to you. So Father, we're praying for specific people. Praying that you'd give us the courage and the opportunity to share in this, Lord. We pray that lives would be changed for all eternity. So much is going on in our world today. People are asking questions. And Lord, we have the answer because the answer is you. So now, Father, we ask all this in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And amen.